Right here we're making things happen. Shaping the future, it starts today. Yeah, it starts with me. So I put my walk in it. Me not believe in luck and talk in it. Right here we're making things happen. Shaping the future. I've seen my talk. Our future is in our hands. In looking towards the future, you have to first look at the past. So today, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit of my own story, looking at my past and examining what has happened so far. And I really do hope that you can draw some parallel to yours. Can I have the next slide, please? In the late months of 2007 and early months of 2008, I was robbed three times on the streets of Lagos. The first time, I had gone to pick my mom up from the airport. We had a flat tire. We stopped to change it on Mobile Ajiba and Cantoni. Guys came on the back of two bikes with guns, robbed us of all our possessions, including the car keys. The second time, I was driving home from school and was around CMS area. The AC in my car wasn't working, so I had my windows up because I knew it was unsafe but I was roasting under the hot heat of Lagos sun. So I decided to wind down to get a little bit of air. Immediately I did that, two guys came, one on my side, one on the passenger side, with knives, asking me for my bag. I said something to them in Yoruba, which is not my natural language of choice. And the one on my side told me in Yoruba, oh, you are one of us. Okay, give us all the money you have. So I did. That day, I got to save my bag, my phones, and my IDs at the very least. On the third occasion, I was driving, I went to fix the tires that caused the first robbery in the first place. And I was on my way home on the bridge above Abalinde, and the guy came again with a knife. And he's like, give me your bag, your phone. This time, you know, I was an expert in this field, so I negotiated. I gave him money and got to keep my bag. But as you would imagine, at that point, it wasn't just me that had all this bad luck. The system was faulty. I was frustrated. It only made sense that I should leave the country and find a better life in somewhere else where the grass is greener, right? But I had a master's degree that I was going to get in about nine months from that day. So I was like, it makes sense for me to get my master's and then I'm bailing. In trying to get my master's degree, I studied architecture. I was posed with a problem to choose my thesis topic. And something very interesting happened. I was driving again. I'm always driving. <laughs> Somewhere on, um, I just said I do And these children came up to the car to try and wipe down my windscreen. You know, I wasn't afraid of them. They were cute. If anything, I actually felt empathy for them. And in that moment, it dawned on me that five years from that day, those children on the streets who were cute and just wanted to wipe down my windscreen for money would be teenagers. Adolescents would have stolen their innocence. And then, the next time they approach my vehicle, they will see the fear in my eyes, and again, they will rob me. So what happened in that moment influenced what ended up being my thesis project. I designed a children reformatory complex for street children in Lagos. That if it were going to be implemented today, it would still be solving a problem in our country. Um, a wise man once said, Winston Churchill to be specific, we shape our buildings, and then our buildings shape us. So if there's any lesson I learned from being in university, that was it. So now, you know I'm taking you on a journey through my life. We're going to fast forward. I had practiced architecture, gotten bored, and dived into e-commerce. So I'd landed myself a job in one of Nigeria's leading e-commerce firms, and I had, had the title of head of administration. My job role was very interesting. I had a lot of things I had to do, a lot of people to interact with on a daily basis. So I started to make some observations in that time of my life. First, we had to 
rent warehouses. Would you imagine that only one in th four warehouses in Lagos actually belong to Nigerians? Majority of them are owned by foreigners. We have next slide. So when I got to that realization, I was like, okay, this is interesting. The second task I had that kind of struck me was furniture. This company was growing fast. We had to sit over a thousand people in different locations. So I needed furniture. It was a big problem. I found a company that could supply and you know install this furniture in no time. But I had a problem. Two months down the line, the furniture starts to give way. So I got angry and I was like, you know what? I'm going to fix it. I'm going to find another company who can give, give me, you know, better quality stuff. You know, logically, that's the thing to do. So I found another company, made a selection. I was happy. You know, this was going to be, you know, I'm solving all, all these problems. So I asked for the address of the warehouse so that we can come and pick up the furniture we've ordered. And I was given the same address as the previous company I had been buying from. So to my surprise, I was like, what's going on here? I quickly learned that the owner of the two companies were first cousins. Those were smaller businesses from their grandfather's business, which again was a foreign-owned foreign business. That make me, made me really wonder what is going on here. Quickly, I'll give you a third example. We were to procure um, plastic bags to be able to ship fast-moving consumer goods around the country. And instead of importing, it was only natural to say, let me find it in my environment. Again, I went on my search. I know you're not surprised. I found another foreign owned business in my country. So this makes me wonder. Most of those businesses have longevity. They've been around for years, almost 100 years. Their grandparents were the ones that made that way for them. What were my grandparents doing when people were acquiring land and setting up industry and infrastructure in Nigeria? That made me really wonder. Weddings? Oh, and be. What were we really doing with our time? So, this brings me to my now. And this can I have the next slide? I would like to take you guys on a little journey with me, something which is fast becoming my TEDx game. I'd like you to please close your eyes. Are you guys ready? Ready? Now, I would like to, I would like, to, I'll give you a word and I want you to imagine the character of the person that is synonymous to this word. Are you guys ready? Dreadlocks. Now open your eyes. Sorry? Okay, fantastic. But I would say that most of you thought um, along the lines of somebody who is creative in entertainment or, you know, probably smokes a little bit of Indian hair, irresponsible, and all of that. But the truth is, that is just the label. What I do now for a living is that I own a small business where I help people grow their natural hair in its locked form. And in case you are wondering, what I have on my hair is all my Nigerian hair. So, in my day-to-day -day life, I convince people that what they have is good. The hair that is growing out of their hair can grow. And it's almost like the most ridiculous job to have. But where did this mentality come from? It comes from colonialism and mental slavery. Back in the day, for you to be able to get some benefits in Nigeria, you had to have lighter skin and straighter hair. Hence, skin bleaching, Brazilian weave, and X and X and X. But my point is, there is something in us. The people you see on the screen, not all of them are entertainers, musicians. As a matter of fact, the first person right there is my mom, who chose to start her own locks about three and a half years ago now. The point is, we need to recognize 
what is around us. We need to see the value in what is in us. So, back in 2007, when I was being robbed, there was value in that robbery. There was space to create a better future for those children. 100 or so years ago, there was value in our land. There was value in manufacturing. Our people just did not see it. Now, um, there's an African investment summit coming up later this year, and the experts in that industry have lined up these five things, and they say that if we can focus on this, this is how we move Africa forward. This is how we change our future. Basically, light up and power Africa, which is very familiar to us. Feed Africa. I'm going to diverse a little bit on the Feed Africa part. I met a young lady um, a couple of years ago in Jos, and she showed me pictures of tomatoes on her phone. They were on hectares of land, like till infinity. And I was like, what is this? And she said, it's tomatoes, and they are all going to get rotten. But every year in Lagos, there's a crisis where tomato, tomato prices skyrocket. This is an opportunity. You and I can be shipping this thing down in whatever way we can, but that is how we shape our future. We need to industrialize Africa. We need to integrate Africa. We need to improve the quality of life for the people in Africa. I must also add something else with the just killings in northern Nigeria. We need to stop seeing ourselves as different. There's power in our numbers. We are 180 million of us. We can sell to each other and all be rich. Killing each other is not the problem. All we really need to do is think differently. Um, basically out of time, so I'll wrap this up very quickly. Can I have next slide? Um, I have seven suggestions that I have adopted in my life that I think you might be able to learn from. First, you are not insignificant. You have the power to change things. We oftentimes look to one man to change it, but that one man is you and me. Follow your passion, focus. What you are looking for in Sokoto is right inside your Shokoto. Um, trust yourself, be consistent, have courage against all odds, and above all, to thyself be true. I'm going to wrap up very quickly by telling you another short story that was told to me by my friend called Chris when I was preparing for this TED talk. He said to me, a salesman was sent somewhere in Africa to sell shoes, and when he landed, he saw that nobody had shoes. So he called home and said, they don't wear shoes here. Do not bother sending any shoes. I'm coming back home. A few months later, another more enthusiastic salesman was sent to the same location. He got there and saw that nobody had shoes. He called home and was like, send all the shoes. Nobody here has shoes. So it depends on what side of the coin you're looking. The future is in your hands. How are you going to play it? Thank you.